Oh, I don't know. This is Zimbabwe, for God's sake. Hey, look, I'm back home. To delve effectively into Zimbabwe controversial writing legend Dambuzo Marechira's mind, it is important to take a close look at his now famous 1978 magnum opus, House of Hunger. The novella is too similar to Marechira's life not only in event but also in philosophy. Generally, Dambuzo Marechira was a vessel of self-contradictions who sought in vain to find his place in a world of black suffering. Seriously, trying to understand this guy's behavior is straightforward as trying to understand this. And if you look, the, the US Dora, the Dora Dora, some of them it gives us some pain, it gives out, you know, you know, you know, you know the money which are being uh, handled in the, someone's the, the brazer. I'm sorry, what? Anyway, not only does the book reflect his actual real life cynical attitude, it is closely constructed around his actual dark experiences that can also explain this attitude. Was the seemingly troubled author an insane genius or just insane? Or was there a method to his madness? Or was he just mad? <laughs> Welcome to our Meme C special philosophy into the mind of the legendary author as we try to answer the question, was Ambuja Maricha really mad? There is no doubt he was an amazing writer, but what probably drew more attention towards him than most authors of his generation was his quote, really eccentric character. That he was already being depicted as the outrageous critic. The alienated outsider. His German mistress Florent Vietwald even called him a troublemaker, whose his ruthless critique of all types is attitudinizing, is utterly liberating. <laughs> okay, I have no idea what the hell that means, but it sounds good. That's all that matters. I mean, with this guy's level of intelligence, he could have been a prominent lawyer, a professor, even the president if he put his mind to it. Instead, he became this. To survival. I'm used to sitting in the streets. I, uh, I'm used to, uh, well, rough, uh, well, roughing it up. Ambuzo Marechera was born on June 4, 1952 at Vengere Township in Rusapi. He grew up in an impoverished and oppressive environment where he first discovered his love for reading and writing. After he demonstrated incredible academic skills from an early age, he was later enrolled at then mostly white University of Rhodesia. He is later expelled for protesting against institutionalized racism at the school. Marichira, although never graduated, everyone who encountered him often agreed on one thing. He was a very gifted and a rare intellect. As an adult, Tambuzo was very unpredictable, reckless and volatile. He would push away people from his life, pick up fights, cause huge scenes, being dirty, sleeping around street pavements and spending all his money on pot and booze. He got into a lot of fights and provocations where he even threatened to murder people. To keep it plain and simple, he was just an overly difficult person to be around. Um, you are one of those South Africans whom South Africa has always hated. That's why I've always trusted you. Because when you heard this to say, you were a gorilla, you kill people. I've never been with somebody who killed people. Either very insensitive or deliberately provocative. I just want it to know your feelings. You set it up, he's right now your pick a name. Um, he's right now your servant, he's working for you. Right. You are the film director, you know, right now look at him, he's sitting there. Sort this oh. up. F you. He later transferred to the University of Oxford in UK after being expelled mm. from Zimbabwe, of course, where he again caused waves and was deemed too hot to handle. Get it? Too hot to handle. He tried to burn the Oxford College building which resulted to the third and final expulsion of his life. On a more positive note, he read and wrote a lot of stuff which allowed him to write many classical books and plays you see today like Black Sunlight, Mind Blast, The Toilet and of course House of Hunger before he tragically died of AIDS in 1987. Now back to House of Hunger. 
The nameless narrator who is the lead character in the novel might as well be Marechira. This nameless narrator grew up in a poor, broken home and is a heavy drinker and suffered intense racial violence throughout his life. Marechira, on the other hand, was also brought up in pain, poverty and tragedy. And as a boy, reading was his only source of escape before upgrading to blues. I may be seen sometimes as a, a successful writer, but I'm still black. And the black person who has gone through it, as you know, tremendous hardships, not only as a child, but in my youth. And, um, good God, not only in this country, under Ian Smith, but in the United Kingdom. The nameless narrator's brother, Peter, is an impulsive, violent, girlfriend-beating douche who beats his girlfriend immaculate to what is described in the book as a bloody stain and also jerks off in front of the other children to teach them how to have sex. And his mother even has sex with another man while the children are in the room. There's also that part about that man who rapes his wife in public. Mmm. Scandalous. The later event is probably inspired by how his mother is said to have been a prostitute. There are a lot of graphic moments in this book and its imagery is so jarring with its description. The grass is seen in Nobel Prize winning author Doris Lessing compared reading the book to hearing someone scream next door. But for real though, this book ain't for the faint-hearted. <laughs> the nameless narrator even went to the University of Rhodesia and even miraculously slept in the same dorm as Marichel, Manfred Hodgson. The famous opening line, I got my thing. Lifted from just after he's expelled from the Oxford, choosing to be dismissed rather than see a string. Personality wise, the main narrator is an exact replica of who Marechera was as a person. Marechera himself is, as they say, alien to Africa. This is someone who cannot reconcile himself with his African roots. You know, kind of like Kunta Kinte, but in Kunta Kinte's uh, situation, it was more physical, you know. But back to Marichel. Marichel began feeling alienated from even a very young age. He has no place of his own, just like the characters in the novel. His actual feelings of alienation are again explored through the various events, characters, and symbols in the book. The nameless narrator begins to feel the distance between himself and his parents when he involuntarily addresses his mother in English without even knowing he is. Mama, today I have won a prize at school. When I was coming here, he let me ride. Oh, sir, you're not going to go to school. You're not going to go to school. You're not going to go to school. I'm not talking English. Which gets his tiny, hiney slapped. <laughs> he is also called by his unethical brother, Peter. <laughs> or Shakespeare. This may sound endearing, but this is derogatory. Meant to remind him that even at this early age, he no longer belongs to the black community because through the white man's education, he already has been mentally conditioned to think like the white man. Even the success of my own books has made me part of the very system which is an intellectual rape of the black peoples. Mm, kind of like Lucifer from Waiting for the Rain. Hi, my name is Lucifer Menangu. I was born in this place against my will. It is very junk here. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> what douche. In adulthood, upon arriving back home in Zimbabwe in his native lands in 1982, he has a British accent and mannerism and does not even use a single word of Shona. Chris, how are you? Not in the sort of Jane Austen manner. Uh, good God, how can you equate um, 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 revolutionary feeling with, as it were, a reactionary literature? Um, uh, good God. Uh, it is similar to how, again, the narrator loses his native Shona language more and more to English. Marichira in Chris Augustine's documentary admits while riding in the newly independent Zimbabwe in Harare in the early 1980s, he is I'm looking at it as a bloody tourist, not as part of my people. 
Well, frankly, I see myself, frankly, as being totally rootless. I... Referring to Zimbabwe, he wants to go back to Britain even though he only just landed for two hours. This may be a problem for him considering he has been freshly expelled from Oxford and deported from England and without a passport to go back. So the million dollar question now comes to, where does he belong? Where does he call home? As he and his characters are hungry for happiness, meaning identity in a world that does not give it, it is like they are living in a house of hunger. When asked if it was difficult in his childhood, he responded, it? It's easy to get out of the house of hunger if you know there's a way out. But then comes another million dollar question, what is this way out? Because to be honest, I don't see his life or this book offering any sound solutions to this dilemma. Home, home, you mentioned the word home to me, it means nothing. He never found anywhere where he truly called home both mentally and physically. This is where now the theory of existentialism comes in. For those who do not know what existentialism is, the theory says that in the universe we are alone and life has no meaning until an individual goes out of his way to give it meaning. He or she cannot wait for it to be given to him or her by family, society, career, government, school and ancestors or even God. As existential philosophers like French writers Jean-Paul Sartre and Albert Camus believe, we are completely responsible for our own choices. The book itself is without direction or meaning just like Maritra's life. It lacks an overarching plot and just sort of jumps from scene to scene with no chronology or explanation. And then I crashed across her body, those stitches, those stitches, each one exactly biting after the needle's penetration, each one a little stained with blood, they have nipped me maddeningly. My earliest memory is of the skies, squeeing askew and I falling out of apple tree, the fall merely bruised my hands and knees, mother what Wait, wait, wait. Uh, when did mother come into the equation? When we're just talking about Patricia getting beaten to death right now? Well, at least that's what it sounds like. I mean, the use of the word body is obviously not a coincidence, right? Um, okay, moving on. It appears to build up points only to burn them back down again. At times, it's really, really confusing. Each time a character, especially the narrator, seems to grasp meaning something violent, obscene or tragic is waiting anxiously around the corner to undercut it. It's very anticlimactic. In the text, the smaller Edmund who appears at first to be an unlikely hero is ultimately overpowered by the bigger odds against him. This big pan-African douche called Stephen who has been sleeping with this prostitute mother. Okay. Instead of the young, innocent, empathetic hero who is destined to triumph against the bigger villainous odds, like most narratives like David and Goliath or Hercules, he is tragically robbed of this victory because again the book is grounded in a cruel reality. It gets even more tragic when Edmund alone at least he is a monkey and a baboon. Another example is the nameless narrator's white girlfriend Patricia who is beaten to death for being a coat. Come on you cattle of his bitch! Get out of here! Take that cattle with you! Let's sit over there. With no consequence. Then there's that poor soul who goes by the name Nesta who is paid to suck on the white man's balls until she comes into her hair. I know this may sound a little too much for our sensitive viewers, but as I said, this book is not for the faint-hearted. Marichera believed prostitution was probably the only road for township girls who are black. There are just no happy endings in this book, are they? No, you see. House of Hunger is grounded in reality, a cruel and unresolvable reality. So what happens when someone does not even bother to give life this meaning like Marichera's life choices or as in the book? Well, he or she becomes what existentialists call a nihilist. This is a belief or nothing. Yes, absolutely nothing. 
Nihilists do not even bother to find meaning, hope or direction in life. They live as they go, whether there is peace or war, love or hate, order or chaos, health or sickness, to a nihilist it is all the same, because they believe life is a huge random joke. Ha, ha, ha. I thought my jokes were bad. Nihilists believe life is too volatile to give it purpose, value or direction, and trying to do so is simply pointless. I wanted to laugh at the cruel sarcasm that rules our lives. I just wanted to bring down your grim facade and for once let you see the world as I see it, giggling in a corner and bleeding. The only morality in a cruel world is chance. Unbiased, unprejudiced, fair. It is this imperfect world that Marecha loves to relentlessly criticize, regardless of how unstable it may make him look. He was a very vocal critic of English speaking as a colonial too. I think in terms of language, England beat me because I'm still using the English language. Even my own voice is no longer my own. Yet he spoke it all the time because he thought Shona language was, quote, primitive. He is active in protesting against racism, yet he has the audacity to say F the liberation war veterans in their faces. This itself is further evidence of his nihilistic attitude towards life. He does not have a side. You cannot get that impression with statements like, I believe having sex with your own race is excess. My white chick is full of sugar. She's a full body wine with a touch of divinity. Got what? Everything. She's got everything nigger girls don't have. You see, nigger girls are just meat. And I don't like my meat raw. Of course, it's something else when a man is starving for poop. So the secret is that we black folk, we just a bunch of insensuous bastards. The hunger is beyond their control, like many things in his tragic life. Too many of my friends died in the war. While I was um, busy studying, Few of my generation have survived uh, Ian Smith through. Um, few of them are, are even alive enough to appreciate the fact that uh, what we, the outrage we felt when we were under Ian Smith has now actually resolved itself into um, uh, the independent Zimbabwe. He knows this, so he begins reacting to it the best way he knows how. He just starts not to care. As you can see, Nihilism may be the best way to explain his very complicated personality. He does not believe in anything that most people live for like love, religion, peace, family, dreams or hope. He does not believe in relationships because of his critical sharpness. He only sees human error and pretentiousness. I've seen how tenuous human relationships are because they always never depend on who is there and who is not. The closest thing to a relationship he ever had was with German Flora Viet Ward, who pretty much did the most really and happened to be a very, very, very patient human being. Perhaps he believed like other nihilists. Everything will always come crashing down because it is just the way of the world. There's just dirt, shit, and blood. There's just bloody whites and dogs trained to bite us. There's white shit in our history, and white shit on our hands, and in anything we do. The best way to deal with this traumatic and unfair society he is forced to live in is to literally write those horrible wrongs down and drink until he blacks out. It is not uncommon for existentialists to be heavy drinkers as well because it is used as an escape from the reality of meaninglessness. He does not want to acknowledge further the pain of colonization and its effect on him and his people, so he just prefers not to care. He even acknowledges a friend, but indifferently, slashing his wrist in black skin white mask when that friend fails to physically change himself into a white person. And not because of a lack of, not because of a lack of trying. I mean, the book reads this guy took 
three baths a day and scrub the skin until you bled. Kind of like how I use. In his own real life way, he ultimately succumbed to his own madness and tragically died of AIDS in 1987. Another but final anticlimactic ending to his tumultuous life. What House of Hunger cruelly reminds us is life is not a fairy tale. And things can get really bad even if you don't have a say like really bad even more so if you're black like Tupac's mother Afeni Shakar says in the film all eyes on me like all black leaders you have a bullseye on your back being black means walking around with the bullseye behind your back after all Marechara and many like him did not ask to be born in such a cruel violent and racist world where they walk with bullseyes stamped on their backs. So the book through the narrator asks, why should we even care? The book if looked at in this sense offers a reason to Marechera's seemingly careless life choices. I don't like what, um, what I've become. I don't want to talk about wearing my skeleton on the outside. I'd like to show my flesh for once. And if Zimbabweans are my flesh and my people, that's what I'm, I'm trying to get back to. But the hunger which Britain gives to African exiles, that kind of hunger actually has got no remote chance of ever, ever being satisfied in any way, whatever. Maybe he wasn't that crazy after all. This is the society he hoped to escape at the same time knowing he could never do so. The only thing he could and did do was write great literature and give us a life we continue to talk about even 30 years after his death, which makes him quite the tragic hero. Thanks for watching guys. Mimsy Africa. Uh, so I hope we did justice to this guy. I mean this guy is a legend Not only in the English department, but as in the national department of really everyone knows Mary Shira and House of Hunger So I hope we pretty much uh, did justice to the mentality uh, We think might have driven that uh, his life in the writing of the book So it was really fun as you can imagine writing this um, Making this video. It was really fun. So we should just learn to appreciate our African icons like this. I mean, Africa has a lot of rich history that people don't pretty much pay that much attention to. There are a lot of things about African icons and legends and culture and literature that, that people often overlook. So that's pretty much the whole we want to feel here. So uh, I hope you enjoyed the video. We also have other interesting videos that you might find interesting. Um, the Nancho Misa Isn't Just Oratory, the How to Be a Slay Queen with Master Quan Shi Museli, and the Philosophy of Dark Humor uh, with the analysis of Tova Tidy Pie. Those are pretty interesting videos. So if you want to learn and have fun while doing it, I suggest you check those videos out. Yep. <laughs> So please like and follow our brand page on these social media platforms to keep updated on our latest content. So, as always, thanks for watching. Memes.